Hello and welcome to another episode of Twimmel Talk, the podcast where I interview interesting people doing interesting things in machine learning and artificial intelligence. I'm your host, Sam Charrington. What you're about to hear is the third of a series of shows recorded at the Georgian Partners Portfolio Conference last week in Toronto. My guest this time is Graham Taylor, professor of engineering at the University of Guelph, who keynoted day two of the conference. Graham leads the Machine Learning Research Group at Guelph and is affiliated with Toronto's recently formed Vector Institute for Artificial Intelligence. Graham and I discussed a number of the most important trends and challenges in artificial intelligence, including the move from predictive to creative systems, the rise of human-in-the-loop AI, and how modern AI is accelerating with our ability to teach computers how to learn to learn. Georgian Partners is a venture capital firm whose investment thesis is that certain tech trends change every aspect of a software business over time, including business goals, product plans, people and skills, technology platforms, pricing, and packaging. Georgian invests in those companies best positioned to take advantage of these trends and then works closely with those companies to develop and execute the strategies necessary to make it happen. Applied AI is one of the trends they're investing in, as our conversational business and security first. Georgian sponsored this series and we thank them for their support. To learn more about Georgian, visit twimmelaicom slash Georgian, where you'll also be able to download white papers on their principles of applied AI and conversational business. Before we jump in, if you're in New York City on October 30th and 31st, we hope you'll join us at the NYU Future Labs AI Summit and Happy Hour. As you may remember, We attended the inaugural summit back in April. The fall event features more great speakers, including Karina Cortez, head of research at Google New York, David Venturelli, science operations manager at NASA Ames Quantum AI Lab, and Dennis Mortensen, CEO and founder of Startup X.AI. For the event homepage, visit aisummit2017.futurelabs.nyc, and for 25% off tickets, use the code TWIMMEL25. For details on the happy hour, visit our events page at twimmelai.com slash events. And now, on to the show. All right, everyone. I am here at the Georgian Partners Portfolio Conference, and I've got the pleasure of being seated with Graham Taylor. Graham is a professor at the University of Guelph here in Canada. And he did a really interesting talk today on some of the challenges and opportunities associated with machine learning and AI, and particularly around his research area in deep learning. And we're here to spend a little bit of time chatting about that. Graham, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me on the program. I told you this is my first time doing a podcast, so I'm really excited to, being a consumer of podcasts, actually give back to the podcast community. So thanks for having me. Nice. Absolutely. Absolutely. Why don't we get started by having you tell us a little bit about your background and how you got involved in machine learning and AI and what you're up to nowadays. Sure. So currently I'm working as a professor at the University of Guelph. I'm also a member of the new Vector Institute for Artificial Intelligence, which has started up and getting ready to move in in November here in Toronto. I'm the academic director of a program called Next AI, which is a founder development program for startups specifically working on AI technologies. Mm. So I wear a number of different hats, but they're all focused on artificial intelligence and machine learning. So let me tell you a little bit about how I entered that space. I often get asked this question of how I got into AI, and fortunately I can point at one specific point in my life, which really convinced me, Mm. and that was an inspiring professor when I was an undergrad student at the University of Waterloo. So I had a course. I believe the course was called Machine Intelligence. Okay. And the way I that course was set up was to actually encourage us all the students to write AI programs to play each other's AI programs in this game called Abalone. Hmm. And it's amazing looking at this effectively. I would say it's been at least 15 years now since we did this, but with all the news last week in terms of this new AlphaGo system by Google DeepMind, right. playing the game of Go, and how it was trained entirely by self-play, this is exactly what we were trying to do on this assignment. It was an mm. easier game, 
but it was really inspirational to build these agents, played against each other. And our team ended up winning the competition, made us really proud and excited and eager to do more work. Nice. Yeah, so that's what started it all off. Okay. And so what's your path been so far? So from that point, as an undergrad, I got so excited about the potential of AI. Not, I wouldn't say at all, I was sort of going to predict what would, what would happen up, up to this time <laughs> and how, how huge it's growing. But I just absorbed being a technical person. I was really excited about building those, those tools and mm -hmm. wanting to learn more. So I went to the University of Toronto. I knew they had a good machine learning program. They had a number of faculty there who I was aware of, their work, lots of graduate students. It seemed like a great place to, to be. It was not too far away from Waterloo in London, Ontario, where I grew up. Okay. So it seemed like a natural choice. Now, I had no idea how big that group would become <laughs> and the influence that Toronto Machine Learning Group would have on deep learning today. So mm -hmm. I, I, some people asked me about this and I said, well, I, I know I kind of stumbled upon this group. It, it seemed the right place to be for all the right reasons, but it ended up being an amazing time to be there. This is for me 2004 to 2009, mm -hmm. really the start of the deep learning movement. Okay. So a lot of the individuals that are leading the major industrial research labs or even the nonprofit efforts like OpenAI, for example. Mm -hmm. They were students in the group at the time. A lot of the key papers and key ideas that were published and disseminated at that time have gone on, right, to be sort of the, the foundations of AI. And a lot of it came out of that group and the groups that we were having close collaboration with, including mm -hmm. the Montreal, now they call it Montreal Institute for Learning Algorithms, run mm -hmm. by Yasha Bengio. And then the group at NYU, which at that time was led by Yan LeCun. Mm -hmm. And mentioning NYU, that's where I went immediately after PhD. Right. We had a good relationship, working relationship between these three labs, Montreal, Toronto, and NYU. I considered both as postdoc options, but ultimately decided to go to New York for a couple of years mm -hmm. and, and work there as a postdoc, but felt the pull to come home after that. It was really exciting working in New York with Yan, with Rob Fergus, uh, another professor named Chris Bregler. And that really actually got me working in computer vision more. And then I came back in 2011. And my heart was really pulling me not just towards coming back to Canada, but also towards an academic position. Mm. So I had the opportunity to join the faculty at Guelph in 2012. And that's when I started. So it's been five years. Nice, nice. And you mentioned a bunch of names there, but you didn't mention that your advisor for your PhD was Jeff Hinton. I should, yeah, I did mention a, bu a bunch of names, but I didn't credit my PhD advisor. I'm sorry, Jeff. I'm sorry. But I've talked to so many people who he's, you know, impacted via advising and, and other ways. So That's right. I was co-advised by Jeff and another individual named Sam Royce, who is okay. really influential in machine learning. He passed away, actually, in... 2009, right when I started at NYU. Mm. It was tragic to lose him, but I, I certainly want to note his influence on, on my PhD as well. Mm -hmm. It was really amazing having one very senior advisor, Jeff, really, really experienced having worked in the field, but also someone quite junior. Sam had started as a faculty, I think around 2005 or so, mm -hmm. and he was full of energy and also helped me along the way. Awesome. Awesome. So you did a talk here this morning. Tell us a little bit about what your talk was about. Sure. So I, I broke my talk up into three parts. The first part was just introducing myself and telling people a little bit about the work that we do in Guelph and the, the types of machine learning problems we're interested in. The second part of the talk was focused on the challenges and also the opportunities in, in AI. And that was more of sort of a technical discussion of what was coming around the corner. And then the third part of the talk was about some of the barriers some startups might be facing. We're here at the Georgian Partners Portfolio Conference, so there's many startups in the audience. I've done a lot of work with startups. And I tried to focus on, again, some of the, some of the barriers they might face building companies. Mm -hmm. So why don't we start with kind of a rundown of the, the challenges and opportunities as, as you see them? Sure. So I started by talking about the technological changes coming towards us. And I think the, f the first one that I started with was the move from what I would call largely predictive systems to creative systems. So when I say predictive systems, I mean these systems that we're used to interacting with on a daily basis, the systems that might give us a temperature forecast tomorrow, or we might get up our, our mapping application and it would tell us an estimated time to get from A to B, 
or the people on the financial side might be interested in forecasting the price of a particular financial instrument the next day. But those types of inputs, they're either a category or they're a number, they're pretty low dimensional, mm -hmm. and there's usually a single right answer. And so when I talk about the movement towards creative systems, I'm talking about systems that produce high dimensional output and where there's no single right answer. So mm -hmm. examples of this sort of more on the creative side would be art creation right. or poetry or music. And while these are some of the more culturally flavored activities, which, which get some attention, there's also some real commercial applications such as automatic email reply or mm -hmm. conversational dialogue systems or I showed a, a proposed design for a robot that's creating meals and serving to, them to you every day. And so I, I talked about some of the challenges in building those kinds of systems. Yeah, I thought that one was pretty interesting. Folks that listen to the podcast will be pretty familiar with the idea of generative networks and style transfer and, you know, creating you know, all the efforts we've seen to like create movie scripts and poetry right. and all this kind of stuff. And so the, the kind of the art example was really, has been really front and center for me for a while. But then when you, when you kind of describe the recipe creation, that's a totally different domain than one that we hear about all the time. Maybe because there are a bunch of different disciplines that need to come together for, for us Absolutely. to really explore, you know, or fulfill that, the Jetsons vision. Totally, right? yes. But we're, you know, quickly moving towards an area where a lot of, you know, opportunities and value exists around generative, using neural networks specifically and AI in general for generative purposes. What are the key challenges there in your mind in that transition? I'm particularly interested in this as an engineer. I work in an engineering school. I, mm -hmm. I, I build things, and I think we're seeing design migrate over from purely human design to at least at this the next few years being machines and humans working together on design and building objects, whether they be recipes or they be parts for mm -hmm. vehicles or, or aircraft. So I think the, the major challenges in working towards a more algorithmic design would be what I pointed out this morning, namely the fact that there's no single right answer mm -hmm. for design. You have potentially infinite number of solutions to a problem or designs that would be acceptable. Mm -hmm. And this makes it very hard to come up with reward signals or what we would call objectives for machine learning systems, depending, yeah. on, depending on how they're trained, right? So for us, when we, when we think about a simple task like, a task like image classification, image goes in, category comes out, right. we compare it with the ground truth category. There's usually a single right answer. For a system, going back to this recipe example, how do you sort of how do you measure the output of the system that cooks you a right. meal? I mean, you can I guess get some sort of subjective judgment of the the person eating the meal, but it's not really calibrated with other right. people. And it's also just that single reward. These are the types of rewards maybe that are being used in reinforcement learning systems. They're very weak signals as yeah. well. So it'd be nice to maybe find find some sort of medium between this like weak subjective reward or the explicit guidance that works for supervised learning systems. Mm -hmm. The other, the other and part. And how far of, along are we in that against that challenge, like that particular approach? Yeah, I think we've seen, as you mentioned, the, the, the listeners of the podcast are going to be familiar with examples, particularly in the visual side of generative systems. Mm -hmm. That's kind of where we're stuck right now is evaluating generative systems, mm -hmm. coming up with quantitative metrics, one to evaluate them, but also maybe as a way of feeding this kind of quantitative metric back into the system to make them better, right? Mm -hmm. How do we improve the, the objectives to train them? So then we've also seen a lot of progress really recently on the reinforcement learning reward side. Mm -hmm. But we aren't really anywhere, I think, on the sort of merger of those two systems. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot more to be done. And particularly, we, we've seen a lot of nice examples in the generative space of language, right? So machine translation systems, conversational dialogue systems, but I think we're still stuck in, in coming up with the right kinds of metrics. So you have, an, say, an English sentence going in and a French translation coming out. Again, there's so many possible valid translations. Right. We're still, in most cases, stuck at measuring the, a, a single, maybe I would say a canonical example given in some, some data set with the output of the system rather than really considering the space mm -hmm. of the potential answers it could give. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
One of the examples that you use was Inbox by Google, which I also use. And you went a little further. You have a, a percentage in your mind of the time uh, that you use that for responses. I'm not quite there yet, but I do use the responses every once in a while. But you also talked about you talked about a bunch of concepts, you know, transfer learning, you know, meta learning, few shot learning. And one of the questions that I had as you were kind of going through this was, you know, what are the kind of the mechanisms and approaches for using, you know, in a large scale system, the feedback that you provide by selecting, you know, one of these responses in conjunction with the, like the broader model that's trained for everybody. And, and what is that, what's that problem called? What are the approaches? Like how far are we along in, you know, developing a body of thinking around that? Right. So I think I was referring to this Google inbox client and I'm a big fan of it and a user of it. And like you said, some percentage of the time, the auto email reply feature, it's what I would call a human in the loop system. And Mm -hmm. and, and what I was saying earlier this morning is essentially, I wouldn't want to necessarily hand over all my email to an automatic reply system. Sure, AI is not at that stage where I I could stop writing emails and people would just interface with me through this, this agent. But it's working at the level where it can propose several candidate replies, and I can still execute judgment over there. I can decide not to send the email at all. I can decide to not accept the proposals and write an email myself. I'm still completely in control. Mm -hmm. But it's making me more efficient when it once in a while proposes something that I can just click on and it will will send. So I would say this is a system, it's a human-in-the-loop system. It's where I maintain the judgment over what goes out. And I see this as an effective paradigm of humans and machines working together over the Mm -hmm. near term. But I also really like this idea of the transition from sort of full human control over a particular task all the way to fully automated Mm -hmm. performance, but this gray area in between. And a company that I co-founded in in Toronto named Kindred, they're actually exploring this for robotics, where essentially the company is is teaching robots to perform tasks that are very difficult to automate by allowing a human operator to control one or more robots. So the robot will be autonomous, but when Mm -hmm. it gets into trouble, it can be taken over by a remote operator who sort of gets it out of that, whatever it's stuck doing. Interesting. And the hope is, again, to, if this happens enough times, the robot learns about the way that the human assisted it in getting out of that particularly difficult situation Mm -hmm. so that it becomes more and more autonomous. So again, it's not 0% or 100% automation. We're sort of exploring that, that, that gray area in between. So I really like this paradigm. As you're using Inbox, it's presenting you these possible emails that you might want to respond with. It gives you three. You choose one. You know, that's potentially augmenting the set of training, label training data that the system has. And, you know, one way for Google in particular or someone building a system like this in general is to kind of throw that all in and, you know, continuously update the model and produce better models that are trained on more data. It strikes me that another way for a system like this to operate is that there's, you know, there's a general component of the model, but then there's a subcomponent of the model that's personalized to me and the way I respond. And the question is really, is anyone doing that? Does that have a name? Are there architectures for that? Have you ever come across that? So I would say this fits into the idea of personalization. And I think it's important for a product like Inbox to have some element of personalization. A colleague actually told me that he doesn't use Inbox because it makes him sound like a California dude. (laughs) He said it puts exclamation marks on everything he says and Uh uses terms like awesome exclamation mark, which he wouldn't say himself. Okay. So Interesting. And he also claims that when I send him emails, he can tell when it's coming from the, the Google inbox auto reply system. So again, what would fix something like this and maybe make him an adopter is a system that would adapt to his own style right. of writing right. emails. Which also ties back to the, the bias element of the conversation in a, a more subtle way than you know we sometimes think about it. Exactly. So why is it making him sound like a California dude? Well, maybe it was fit on a <laughs> bunch of uh, emails from people in California, right? right? So. Right. 
It certainly ties back to that. I, I think in terms of how to how to talk about this, and, and you, you even raised the idea of having a model that's been built from a whole lot of data, sort of a master model, and then personalized models for each of the people, and, mm-hmm. and sort of adapting. I think we we do see it. It's it's an instance of transfer, right? So you can. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I was talking today about you know how do you deal with these problems where you have a very limited amount of labeled data, and I said, well, it's very popular right now to train a model on a big generic data set and then cut off the top of it and then replace that with something more specific and then train on a very much smaller set of data. So you can take something like generic object recognition, a big image net style data data set, and then tackle a task like bird species classification, Mm -hmm. which is fine grained, but you have much less data. But that works because there in in the big system there are birds in it right like right. there the the data center image net has birds so you can learn about feathers and wings and and colors of birds and beaks and those sorts of features that works when there's good match between the two different domains and so this what you're saying in terms of personalization it can be viewed that way mm. as well like you have yeah. a large data set of a whole bunch of different speakers and you can learn a model on that but then you want to transfer or adapt this system to a, a particular individual where you have a smaller right. subset of data. And it, it makes sense. You wouldn't want to necessarily have a, a model for each individual person that work in isolation because there's probably not enough data there to generalize well. Mm-hmm. In that case, you want to capitalize from the, all of the email that Google is holding in its uh, right. servers from <laughs> people using Gmail. Okay, okay. So additional challenges that you were describing. Oh, yeah. So I think we had gotten, we'd really only gotten across the sort of the two um, (laughs) opportunities coming across. I could could move into challenges or I could tell you about another couple of things that are coming across as sort of trends. So maybe I'll, I'll try to finish those off. The two trends that I hadn't mentioned yet, one was this idea of moving from careful human construction to learning to learn. Mm. So right now, like these, these systems yeah. are like the output of the hard work of graduate students and the faculty members advising them and researchers and right. practitioners. I mentioned about the migration from feature engineering to architecture engineering, right? The, the way that people describe deep learning often is that, oh, it's the end of feature engineering. Mm-hmm. We no longer have domain experts who craft very specific features. We can learn all the features with deep learning. Right. And I saw you had a picture of Stephen Meredith's article on your slide, which I've talked about on the podcast a while ago. Okay, fantastic. So I, I, I love that blog, blog post, and it really, I, I, I think it's totally accurate. We've moved into the world of architecture engineering. Mm-hmm. And so one way of getting out of this is essentially having these meta-learning style algorithms. Mm-hmm. I mentioned a specific example in our lab where we're dealing with multimodal data. So in this case, we might have video and audio, and, and we, we had motion capture coming in. And so we're figuring out how to actually merge those different modalities. I mean, the nice thing about deep learning models is with multimodal learning, you have so many opportunities of how to extract representations from the different modalities Mm -hmm. and how many levels of representations you should go for each of those and when they should be merged together and which modality Uh should be merged. But there's all these decisions to be made. And so you can either have a grad student like we had who's (laughs) just really skilled at figuring this all out and spends a year working towards a competition, But ultimately, ultimately, we'd like to hand that over to an algorithm that figures that out. And that's what we've done. So the, you know, that's one instance of learning in architecture. I know Google Brain has been working on this with a reinforcement mm-hmm. learning. They worked on learning optimizers. They're now working on, and other people are also working on learning activation functions. Mm-hmm. So really, like it's, yeah, hand it over to the, the algorithm. And, and this meta-learning is really exciting. There's some some great work that was done at Twitter before you go to show moved over to, to Google Brain on learning an algorithm that's just good at few shot or one shot learning. Mm-hmm. Also an instance of meta learning. So there's it's an it's an exciting area. I think after Steven's article came out, I spent a long time trying to through my interviews, trying to understand the process of architecting deep neural networks and I guess it took me longer to, you know, and retrospectively, it took me longer than it should have to figure out, you know, the gradient descent by graduate student. There are a right, couple of yeah. different versions of this. Graduate and you student just, descent. Graduate yeah. student descent. And, you know, to at least, you know, it seemed like a year ago or so, like that was the state of the art. But since then, you know, you described a number of 
methods for kind of automating architecture. One of the ones that you mentioned was a, a Bayesian-based approach. And That's there right. were some others. Can you go into a little bit more detail on the various ones that you mentioned? Sure. So we explored a couple different approaches in, in my lab for the multimodal learning problem. Okay. One approach is Bayesian optimization, which a lot of people in the deep learning field are familiar with from the point of view as doing model search or hyperparameter optimization. Mm -hmm. So these are the decisions that we all need to make about how many layers and how many units per layer and what kind of activation function. And then on the, uh, the learning algorithm side, how long do we train for? Right. Should we use Atom Optimizer or should we use RMS Prop or what should our regularization coefficients be? There's all these decisions. And, yeah. and, and with deep learning, there's more of these decisions than in classical machine learning models. So people have proposed Bayesian optimization as a, a, a suitable tool, and it, it's actually been very successful in automating some of the hyperparameter search. So we, in, in our first example, we just viewed architecture as another hyperparameter, mm. and we proposed essentially a, a, a search space of potential architectures in which this modality fusion could happen. Mm -hmm. And then we had a, a Bayesian optimization algorithm with a the, the main technical achievement was a, a, a kernel or, or, or a way of assessing similarity between different architectures. Mm -hmm. And that was a building block for the Bayesian optimizer to basically search over that space of potential fusion architectures. Okay. And it came up with one that would beat the graduate student descent <laughs> method in about 30 or so proposals, propo different architectures. Okay. The downside to that system is when I'm saying 30 different architectures, each of those had to be trained and evaluated. Mm -hmm. And then that result given to the Bayesian optimizer such that it could propose the next one. Mm -hmm. So it's this iterative method in which you're training full architectures to convergence, you're evaluating them, you're choosing another one, going back, evaluating. And so it gets quite slow. We explored a second approach in which we do we view architecture search as stochastic regularization. It's kind of a, a meaty thing to say, but it's the, what you see in methods like dropout, where people just knock out activities randomly in neural networks. There's also drop connect, where people knock out weights. Mm -hmm. And this is done on a, an example-by-example example basis. So every time you present a new example to the model, you knock out a different subset of hidden activities, mm -hmm. or you knock out a different subset of weights. So they call this stochastic regularization, and it's been shown to make networks generalize better. And it was very popular until some things like batch norm came along. People started working with that. But still, it's a, it's a general principle. For us, we did this kind of block-wise knocking out certain weights mm -hmm. inspired by an approach by a graduate student at CMU called blockout. And okay. what this student found with this blockout is that if you knock out sort of blocks of weights, this can give you very different architectural patterns mm -hmm. made through this weight structure. So you can have sort of mergers of groups of hidden units or splits, right. or you can just completely ignore certain features that are being discovered in the network. And we basically propose a modality-aware version of this. So it would, as it's training, explore many different multimodal fusion architectures mm -hmm. and then eventually converge to one that worked pretty well. So that ended up being more efficient than the Bayesian optimization approach. Okay. Okay. That's pretty technical. No, that's, that's great. That's good. That's great. <laughs> okay. And then there was another challenge. Yeah. So I talked about the idea, which is both an opportunity and a challenge of explainability mm -hmm. in AI, right? And I don't know if you've talked much about explainability yet. We've on, talked a on little bit about it. I don't think you mentioned it in your talk, but I did a, an interview with Carlos Gestrin, who has a paper called Lime, which seeks to do explainability. I appreciated the, you were quoting someone else, I believe, and, and you took issue with, you know, we often talk about neural networks as black boxes and I think you, you, well, you can. You yeah, sure. Draw I can talk about that. that. It was actually a quote by Kyungyun Cho, a researcher at NYU. And okay. he came to Toronto last summer very graciously to be part of this next AI program for startups. So, p part of that program, we bring in world class individuals like, like Cho, and okay. they talk about various things. He was doing a course on NLP, but he criticized people calling neural networks black boxes and said, that, you know, they're actually white boxes. And that was mm -hmm. kind of neat because this, or after my talk, Nicola Paperno talked about black box versus white box attacks. Mm -hmm. And it's the same concept here. Neural nets, like in, in some sense, you, you can open them up. You can look at their parameters. Mm -hmm. You just happen to have hundreds of millions of parameters most right. of the time. And they're just uninterpretable, right? right? So right. 
they're not i mean if if you're accessing them through an online service like in 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 Paprino's work they were trying to attack a method that had been uh, mm-hmm. deployed i think one was on metamind services right. one was on amazon one was on google and if you're interacting through it through the predictions yes it's black box right. but if you're the person evaluating the machine learning system or maybe if you're your model, if it's your model it's right. black box right Right, and generally, but still, un, still uninterpretable. It's still uninterpretable. So that's why we're we're keen to move to more interpretable systems or explainable systems in certain setups. So we've looked at it sort of in in, in the medical space. Mm-hmm. We've looked at it in the financial prediction space, forecasting, and then we've looked at sort of the classical vision problems on the, the sort of the benchmark data sets that everybody else mm-hmm. benchmarks on. And yeah, I guess it's like. When you teach t- about software and you're talking about requirements gathering and how much money you're going to spend on each stage of the sort of the software development life cycle, it's the same thing. Assess the risks. Like some problems right. require more careful consideration of risks, others others don't. And right. I'd say that the same thing about interpretability and explainability. I mean, th- let's see what the application is. Mm-hmm. Who are the users? What are the risks involved? And in many cases, we likely want to make the system more explainable. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, then opportunities. We've, yeah. we've arrived to <laughs> opportunities. Yeah, actually, we've gone. Sorry, we've gone through a lot of opportunities, and 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 I'll move more into sort of barriers. Let's say that the okay. last part was some of the barriers, and when I talked about barriers, it was I'll just go quickly through them. Data. Mm-hmm. The next one was talent, mm-hmm. and then the third one I talked about was building trust. Mm-hmm. So we we can did, maybe go in and dissect each of these. I mean, first of all, for data, I think in deep learning, we've seen a tremendous number of really cool examples of deep learning working yeah. in practice, but I would argue that it's been done in a fairly limited set of domains. Mm-hmm. The ones I mentioned were the, the big three, vision, speech, and audio processing, and then natural language. Right. And these are generally unstructured domains where there's a lot of data, you label data in particular. Mm -hmm. These are the sorts of applications being pursued by the commercial internet giants, right? right? And actually, it's it's, it's something I've had a struggle with in my lab, just motivating some students to tackle other kinds of problems where benchmark data sets are not available. So I actually mentioned today, for example, some agricultural applications that we've worked on. But again, you're rewarded more as a researcher to conduct your experiments reasonably quickly, get your papers out, mm-hmm. and compare to other people in the literature. And, you know, so you download ImageNet, you propose a new architecture, <laughs> you publish paper on it. At the end of the day, if you want to solve a problem that actually, you know, really important problem like growing food in an environmentally friendly way, in a sustainable way, and that gives decent yields for the farmers and you want to explore say deep learning for remote sensing in in agricultural fields Mm -hmm. this involves a crazy amount of data collection it takes a lot of work to get out in the field do those flights say say uav flights do the ground truthing which involves actually collecting samples say you're you're looking at soil properties or Mm -hmm. or nitrogen properties of plants so this might take a summer, it might take multiple growing seasons, and you actually don't see the effects of any interactions until the end of the growing season when you actually can measure right. neat yields. So this is not the same time frame of a lot of the experimentation that happens in machine learning. So again, going back to the AlphaGo example, the system is able to play two and a half million games against itself because it, <laughs> it, it can carry out a game and get the reward in right. less than a second. Right. In an agricultural situation, you can't get a reward in less than a second. It's yeah. six months, right, right. Or, or, right, or longer. So anyways, this is a bit of a ramble just saying that we're fairly limited in the ways that we're applying deep learning right now. Mm-hmm. And it's a lot about the data, like the how do you collect the data, where do you get the data, how hard is it to to gather that, process it. And so anyways, there's a quote by Chris Dixon that I gave at, at the end, which was, data is really the key ingredient to mm-hmm. AI because it's the missing ingredient. So we publish our algorithms, like there, there, there's great algorithms out there, they're available to people. Compute power has really grown and it's become cheaper, so we have access to great compute. So it's really the data that we, that we don't have, that's the missing mm-hmm. ingredient for these sorts of problems I'm talking about. And it's also, for companies, it's the proprietary ingredient. So people aren't publishing data sets as quickly as they're publishing papers on algorithms. Mm-hmm. What's one of the challenges that I, that I see is, is, is data. 
Well, if you can maybe quickly summarize the other two and leave us with any final thoughts as we wrap up. Sure. So in terms of the other two, one is was, is talent. And I, I think this is the idea of companies faced with, well, how are we going to fill these positions where we need really skilled people in machine learning? Mm-hmm. And whether, you know, questions around, oh, do we need PhDs or master's graduates good enough? Can we take somebody trained in a different area and, and move them into machine learning field? I think there's a lot of amazing stuff going on here, particularly in, in not just Canada, but Toronto. There was an announcement last week by the provincial government to fund Vector Institute with $30 million to work with the Ontario universities Mm -hmm. to develop professional graduate programs in AI and machine learning. Mm -hmm. And in five years, we're going to be looking at graduating 1,000 students per year. That will be the the, the goal for steady state in Mm -hmm. this province. I think we're addressing that issue with Mm -hmm. talent right now. But as I mentioned today, we also have a lot of professors leaving academics, right. going to work in industry part-time or full-time, and we need to work on retaining those individuals. I think decisions like starting this is the government supporting AI yeah. initiatives, initiatives like Vector and Mila and Amy in, in, in Alberta, those are all working toward making, this, making academics attractive mm-hmm. in this field versus industry. But I think we need to do more to encourage the people staying in academics or, or moving into academics to continue to train the, the next generation. And then the final topic was on trust, right? Building trust. Right. And actually, we've already touched on a couple of those issues. Explainability yeah. was one. Right. Bias and fairness. I tend to like the idea of using technology as, as actually, as Nicola Paperno said in, in his talk following mine, these ideas around differential privacy preserving algorithms mm-hmm. to increase people's trust in machine right. learning systems rolling out technology like fair representations for removing bias from algorithms that make mm-hmm. predictions. And so I think I, f- I feel pretty good about the future yeah. of AI. And I'll, I guess I'll, I'll summarize it that it's a great field to be working in. This Toronto area is a, a great place to be working on these technologies. Mm-hmm. There's a lot more to come. And I think in terms of the problems, I do see a diversification in the future of the types of tasks we're solving. Mm-hmm. And I think they're at least working with the, the startups in the next AI program. I also see a lot of interest, both from the, the companies building these technologies, but also from the investment side right. and companies that are doing social good mm-hmm. as well. So building both profitable companies, but also solving real important issues. And so that's what I look forward to. Awesome. Well, Graham, thanks so much for taking the time to sit with me and share all that you've shared about your kind of vision for this and and how you see it. Thanks a lot. It's my pleasure. Great to meet you. Great. Thank you. All right, everyone. That's our show for today. Thanks so much for listening and for your continued feedback and support. For more information on Graham or any of the topics covered in this episode, head on over to twimlai.com slash talk slash 62. To follow along with the Georgian Partners series, visit twimlai.com slash gppc2017. Of course, you can send along feedback or questions via Twitter at twimlai or at Sam Charrington or leave a comment on the show notes page. Thanks once again to Georgian Partners for their sponsorship of the show. Be sure to check out their white papers, which you can find by visiting twimlai.com slash Georgian. Thanks again for listening and catch you next time.